We thank you, Lord, for entering this life. We thank you for being here among us now. Give us your peace, your spirit, as we sit a bit before you, before your manger. Sit at your feet. Bless you, Lord. I, I discovered a little book the other day. I don't know even how I found it, but I was captured by the title. The title brought together two things that just didn't seem to typically go together, and so it caught my imagination. The title is Power of Gentleness, Meditations on the Risk of Living. Now, I typically wouldn't associate gentleness and risk. I wouldn't associate people who are adventurous, who experience the risk of living with those who are gentle. This book's written by a brilliant French psychiatrist, a woman named Anne Dufourmontel. Now, to be honest, I, next, I know next to nothing about her. I don't really know what she believes. I don't really know how she came to this place. I know that she's considered brilliant. I know as a psychiatrist in the work she did, she often sat listening to people say, I don't know. I just can't seem to get there. I just can't seem to, to live, you know, to grasp it. I've got this stuff that holds me back, or I've got these weights, or I've got this friction in my head, or whatever it is. They're struggling to live with a sense of peace inside, with a sense of fulfillment. They're struggling to put together a coherent, larger story. So, she realizes over time that gentleness gives them space to be able to heal and to enter into, again, the risk that's involved in living. So I'm reading this little book. I'm not all that ways into it. I don't know where it goes. But the other day, I stumble on this. With the advent of Christianity, she says, the awaited King Messiah in all his splendor is placed, is replaced by a child born in poverty and exile, placing spiritual royalty in the place of the greatest vulnerability, was a coup de force unprecedented in history. All the values of merit, of power, of prowess, found themselves disrupted. Dear friends, we come again. We come again this Christmas Eve in awe and in wonder at what God has done. Our God, friends, is a God who loves adventure. Creating in the first place was by God an act of adventure. It was an act of his own self-giving love to make space for that which was other than him, which he deeply loved, even though it may not, and in fact, we did not, continue to respond to him in an embracing fullness of love. God, in even starting the ball rolling in life in general, embarked on a great adventure. He began when he placed beings and things that were his artwork and his handiwork and his image bearers. He began a story. Anything that exists in time is a story. Anything that lives in time, inherently, you can't help but live a story. You're living, time passes, it adds up, it's a story. God writes epic adventures. But here's the thing. God plays fair. Life does not play fair. The universe does not play fair. Circumstances do not play fair. We do not play fair. We can't solve the mystery of why God allows certain things, but in this much at least, God plays fair. When he writes an adventure, when he writes an epic adventure that is sometimes just better than we can believe it ever could have been, is it real? Is it really me? Pinch me, somebody? Sometimes it's more than we can take in for grief's sake. And we know that it isn't even hitting us yet, but it will. But we can't even get there to let it hit us. It's too much. 
at least the God who writes a life of epic adventure, plays fair in that when he writes himself into the story, he comes not as superhero. He writes himself in as a baby, beginning in a womb, in gestation. I, I trust you all know that you are going to get some of this tonight. A little bit of Christmas with John Donne. Seven sonnets, La Corona. La Corona is a crown. Seven sonnets in a ring. It was a form in his day. Donne often busted the forms, but he liked this one, so he kept it. Seven sonnets in a ring make a crown. They sit on a head. It's honor, in honor of someone. The sonnets are connected in that the last line of each is the first line of the next. The first line of the whole is the last line of the whole. The second one is Annunciation, Sonnets on the Life of Christ. Salvation to all that will is nigh, that all which always is all everywhere, which cannot sin and yet all sins must bear, which cannot die yet cannot choose but die, lo, faithful virgin, yields himself to lie in prison in thy womb. Now, she, who wast in his mind, who is thy son and brother, whom thou conceivest conceived, yea, thou art now thy maker's maker and thy father's mother. Thou hast light in dark and shuttest in little room, immensity cloistered in thy dear womb. God plays fair. He writes himself in, in the vulnerability even of gestation. How was gestation for you? Was that fun? Did you do stuff? Do you remember doing summer? No, you don't remember any of that. We have like no control of that, right? He writes himself in. Incredible trust. He's trusting his father from the moment that he is nothing but a little teeny weeny speck emerging not yet even fully emerging, just a little teeny bit emerging. Jesus, friends, recapitulates every stage of human life. He passes through every stage of the life that we live, even that stage of being in the womb when we don't even know that we are. We're not conscious to reflect and say, here I am, who am I, what am I going to do today? Jesus then is born, still has next to no control. He learns, he must. He passes through those wonderful stages where he has wonder at the so-called mere existence of things, as if that were a small matter. He lives in innocence, meaning the kind of innocence that he is unaware of the troubles of the world. But that doesn't last for long. The third sonnet of La Corona is Nativity. Immensity cloistered in thy dear womb now leaves his well-beloved imprisonment. There he hath made himself to his intent weak enough now into our world to come. He's made himself small enough, vulnerable enough. He chose to, he wants to, to join us. But oh, for thee, for him, hath at the end no room. From the very first moment, he is a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, participating in the difficulties of life. Yet lay him in this stall, and from the orient, stars and wise men will travel to prevent the effects of Herod's Jealous general doom. See thou, my soul, with thy face eye, how he which fills all place, yet none holds him, doth lie. Was not his pity towards thee wondrous high that would have need to be pitied by thee? Kiss him, and with him into Egypt go, with his kind mother who partakes thy woe. Jesus, 
is written into the story. He's born. The suffering begins right away. He's a baby born into a working family. You're shuffled around and bothered by the empire tyrant of the day to be reminded who's in charge. And when I say so, the whole world stops what they're doing and jumps. If that's not enough, shortly after his birth, he's a displaced person, an immigrant, separated from his own land and his own people. Indeed, in one sense, it's the angels and the cosmos who rejoice. It's the cosmos who rescues him. The comet passes by. A bunch of pagan astrologers see it, and they say, ooh, wow, something's happening, and they travel from afar, and they prevent his being killed. From the beginning, he's on his mission. From the beginning, his superpower is simply his knowledge of the story he's living with its risk, with its vulnerability. Last one of the done poems for tonight. Fourth one of La Corona is Temple. Now, Dunn's reaching a bit. This is, well, he's reaching all the time. That's what makes it fun. But he's talking about Jesus at 12 going back to the temple. Joseph, turn back. See where your child doth sit. Blowing, yea, blowing out those sparks of wit which himself on the doctors did bestow. The word but lately could speak, and lo, it suddenly speaks wonders. Whence comes it that all which was and all which should be writ a shallow-seeming child should know? His Godhead was not sold to his manhood, nor had time mellowed him to this ripeness. So Dunn's basically saying, how is this happening? Is Jesus like infused with super knowledge because he's fully divine? Is he walking above the earth? Not really limited, not really a part of it all, but you know, he's connected in some super different way. Well, he does have the Holy Spirit without limit. So in a sense, yes, but in another sense, no. Dunn says that time didn't do this for him either. So how does he come to this? As for one which has a long task, tis good. With the son to begin his business, he in his morning's age thus begun by miracles exceeding power of man. He basically says Jesus understands that God in him has entered the world in lowliness in gentleness. In gentleness, God has taken on the risk of living. And because he's taken it on in gentleness, in lowliness, in vulnerability, because of this, and because Jesus has the lenses to know that that's who he is and that's what his story is, he sees it all differently. And he unties the knots. Even at age 12, the age and traditional cultures of the beginning of adulthood. Jesus then later will say, come to me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart. Jesus, approachable, in solidarity with those who hurt, who are broken. Dear friends, tonight, again, we remember and we celebrate that our God, great as he is, is gentle. That our God, great as he is, other as he is, is present. That our God is wanting you to realize that he wants to be a fellow adventurer with you. He wants you, friends, to know his love in a way that lets you say, I am so happy to be alive. And I am so delighted to be in this adventure of living. And I am not alone. God is with me. God, friends, has written himself into the story. He has walked in risk. He has suffered loss. He knows. He cares, he is present, and he is gentle, 
And he is waiting on you and welcoming you. And he's going to work goodness in your life. Let's sit with him for a minute. invite you friends just to reflect on the fact that God has entered this world and passed through all the stages and the sufferings of life simply invite him to join you in the adventure of your life Ask him where he is. Where is he with you now? What does he want to say to you? 